Welcome to the Praxis Behind the Obscure podcast. And today I have a very special guest. I have uh, Taylor Elwood on today. Can you please introduce yourself? I know that you, uh, you have your hands in a lot of pots, I guess, so to speak, right? So um, yeah, please uh, introduce yourself. Uh, thank you for having me on the show, Ryan, and um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, so I'm Taylor Elwood. I, I do have my hands in multiple pots. I, uh, I'm an occult author. Uh, I've written a number of different books, including The Process of Magic, um, Pop Culture Magic, Space Time Magic, among many others. Um, I, also, I also write um, books on self-publishing. And I also write fiction books. And in the midst of all that, I also create classes for the self-publishing and the occult stuff. And I've been, I've been writing uh, since and, and publishing books since 2003. Uh, so here I am and glad to be here on the show. That's excellent. Well, this is a pretty good time for self-publishing, right? With uh, you know, e-books blowing up and um, you know, with the coronavirus and everything, that sounds like a pretty good time to, if anyone's you know, a writer or whatnot, or interested in writing, you know, check out your course. It sounds pretty cool. Yeah, um, if, if they're interested in the self-publishing, check out my website, indieauthorbusinesssuccess.com. And um, it, it is a good time. I mean, um, it was already a good time even before that because of the fact that, I mean, it, just, just the way things are going. I, unfortunately, the pandemic has made it better. I say unfortunately, because let's be honest here, I don't think any of us want to be in this pandemic any longer than we have to be. I know I'm, I'm cabin crazy and ready to get out and about, mm -hmm. but, you know, we just kind of have to do what we got to do. So, you know, for those mm -hmm. of you listening, wear your masks and, and use social distancing and all that other stuff until we get through the other side, it'll, it'll be worth it. Um, but you know, it is what it is. Exactly. You got to make the most of it, right? So, exactly. uh, do what you can with what you have. Um, so how did you first get into magic and the occult? You said you started, um, writing books on the subject around 2003. Is that right? Correct. So, um, I actually okay. started practicing magic when I, uh, in 1993, I was, um, 16 at the time and um, how I got into it. I, I had always been interested in magic. Um, when I was a little kid, you know, my first, the first books, the first few books that I read was like the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And so I always found kind of, uh, you know, the character of Gandalf fascinating. And then I read the Elric series and some other, other fiction. So I thought it was pretty cool and I, I wished it was real. But of course, you know, it wasn't real. And I was, a, you know, or at least I didn't know that it was real. And, and you know, I was living in a, uh, a Christian household. So, um, you know, that, that certainly had its own role in things. But um, when I was 16, I was, I was, you know, continuing to read fantasy books because I was definitely a geek and a nerd. And um, this, this one kid sat me down one day and proceeded to tell me this story about how he had astral projected and fought a demon. And he would admit to me <laughs> to me some years later that he had told me that story because he wanted to freak me out because I read fantasy books and all that. And he thought he would freak me out. So the last thing he expected is that I would calmly look at him and tell him and say to him, tell me more. And he, he blinked and then he started to tell me more. And I said, well, then you're going to have to bring some books in. I want to learn more about this. Mm. And so the next day he brought, brought a couple pamphlets in um, on astral projection and things like that. And I started reading these books and devouring them. And, and, uh, and, and then I had him take me to the local um, new age occult shop uh, and, mm ended up uh, picking up some books there and, and, and started my exploration because I had always wanted magic to be real. Uh, and, and here it was, it was real, maybe not quite in the way that, you know, I would have liked. I mean, I couldn't toss a fireball at anyone or anything like that, like they do in the fantasy books, but still here was something. And, um, mm -hmm. and, and, and really, I mean, I turned to magic because, um, because I'm a very curious person. I'm insatiably curious. I have lots of questions and, and things like that. And, and I was, I, 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 ironically enough, at the time, I was actually a, a, a born again Christian. I, I, you know, had this <laughs> revelation the year before, and and everything else. But the thing I found was that, you know, these these born again Christians felt like all the answers were only in one book. And not only mm. that, they didn't. They looked dimly on me reading fantasy books. You know, they're like, oh, you shouldn't read those. But I was like, why not? Mm -hmm. It's just fantasy. 
Well, mm -hmm. you know, so 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 when I found out that magic was real, shortly thereafter, I left my born again Christian ways for, for the more <laughs> exotic locales of, of 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 occultism, and and I found that you know here was this opportunity to answer, to ask questions and and explore answers, and and that's what got me into magic. Mm, okay, that's pretty interesting. Um, so the guy, you said the person who initially uh, introduced you or mentioned about the uh, city astral projected himself and fought a demon. Um, are you still in touch with that person, or uh, I'm, uh, I'm just I'm, I'm not in touch with that person. The last time I talked with him, he told me that he had, and that was like maybe a few years ago. He told me that he uh, was a Catholic now, uh, which I thought was kind of funny. And, um, <laughs> and everything else he thought it, it blew his mind that I had been writing books and stuff like that. He knows, he knows the story cause I've told it before. So he knows mm -hmm. the story and everything. And, and he, he thought it was pretty funny. Um, <laughs> unfor un unfortunately yeah. without getting too political, um, I'll just say that he was a bit of a, he was a, he, he was also kind of a, a bit of a Trumpist and, you know, I'm not, <laughs> okay. nothing against, nothing, <laughs> I, I mean, people can vote who they want to vote for and everything else, but, mm -hmm. you know, there's some things that I, you know, when you, when you drink the Kool-Aid, as we saw uh, here in the U.S. on uh, mm -hmm. January uh, 6th or whatever it is, the Capitol riots, uh, you, you see what mm -hmm. happens and, and so, you know, hopefully he, he didn't drink the Kool-Aid too much, but, you know, he went down a different path. I wish him the best, but, he, you know, I, I think it's kind of funny, like he introduced me to that. And, and so it's like, I, I don't know how he'll square that away in mass or whatever, but I'm sure he's figured out somehow <laughs> to do it, you know. <laughs> right, right. It is, it, is the, it is interesting, the little things that can act as a catalyst, right? Like one little conversation or... Um, one book you happen to uh, set your eyes on in a bookstore or, you know, maybe a movie or something like that. I just find it interesting little things that can kind of get you started on this path, right? So, you know, um, it, it, it is interesting because you can, you can meet somebody like once in your mm -hmm. life, you know, for like maybe, you know, and only know them for a short span and yet have them change your life in radical ways, or, you know, you read a book or whatever else. And so, I mean, I, th I think it just goes to show that, you know, under the right circumstances, um, you know, even a casual connection can be something that really opens the doors for you and, and, and points you in a different direction than you might've gone otherwise. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm definitely, sure definitely. I'm sure I would have found my way to, to the occult eventually just because you know I, I grew up in the 1990s you know as a teenager and and that was the time that things started to you know where you started to see more of that so I think you know if I'd gone on to college or whatever I would have found my way toward it but you know I'm glad I found my way to it when I did because like that, that got me started on on practicing magic and on my path of magical experimentation. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious uh, what your current practice is, because usually, you know, you kind of got into how you got got into this. And, uh, you know, usually people find out about a variety of different, what would you say, schools or different systems. And they kind of test this one out a little bit. And then, you know, or maybe they stick in one for the whole time. That also, you know, it's not like that doesn't happen. But a lot of times you get sort of um, bombarded with information and different books, right? And, uh, and then, you know, often come upon maybe one system or kind of an eclectic approach where you kind of fuse a little bit of this and a little bit of that. So yeah, I'm kind of curious, like what, from that point, what direction, did you do a lot of experimentation or was there a sort of um, like a set direction that you went on from, from that point? So when I, I started out, I, I was atypical in the 1990s because I didn't get into Wicca. Um, I got into, mm -hmm. um, a combination of neo hermeticism and, and or neo shamanism and, and elemental hermeticism, basically. Um, you know, I started mm -hmm. reading Ted Andrews books, and and that's kind of, that was kind of that was that was my first major author that I read, and I started exploring stuff, and then I got into the Golden Dawn and ceremonial magic, and from there I moved into um, a combination of, of, of ceremonial magic, a la William G. Gray's works, um, and then also chaos magic, and, and uh, at the same time started exploring Eastern um, paths such as, you know, Taoist meditation and Qigong and, um, and, and, Do, and Dochen, um, Tibetan Buddhism, mm -hmm. basically. Um, practices. And, and so since then, I mean, I, I would say that my magical practice at this point in time is an amalgamation to some degree or another of all of those practices. But beyond mm -hmm. that, 
Um, I've also always had an interest in bringing magic forward and in, in the evolution of magic. So, you know, I've mm -hmm. certainly done a fair amount of work with like, you know, the classical approaches of working with spirits and things like that. But if you were to look, for example, at my bookshelf, you would see an equal number of books on topics such as, you know, um, architectural design and, and um, physics and, you know, anthropological studies of time as mm -hmm. you would see books on magic, because I'm interested in blending modern disciplines, non-occult disciplines into magical work. And, um, and that's what makes me different from most of the other practitioners out there and the authors who are writing books, because most of my stuff is really a blend of both modern, um, modern non-occult disciplines and occult practices and finding a way to make those practices work together. So really, uh, if, if you look at my magical practice, what you end up seeing is a combination of um, all of these things. And so right now, as an example, you know, my, my practice is, my daily practice is kind of the, this invocation of um, the sphere of art, which is working with um, some archangels, the elemental archangels, as well as a few others. Uh, and this was stuff mm -hmm. I learned through uh, Robert Stewart's works. And then it's also um, practicing um, gods playing in the clouds, Qigong, as well as uh, a few other Qigong movements uh, and, and, and learning Bagua and combining all of that together. And then, but then also it's, it's exploring other things. So like I'm, currently uh reading some books on elemental working with elemental spirits because one of the next books i'm going to be writing about is is work working with elemental spirits and i've been working with elemental spirits for most of my magical practice and a lot of what i'll be sharing is stuff that i've done over the years but of course i'm always curious about what other people have to say so you know i'm kind of studying and exploring mm -hmm. what they're saying right now so that way i can contextualize it uh and and, and so you know there's that aspect of it. And then, and then also there's the internal work aspect. So I'm always, you know, kind of engaged uh, in meditation and in internal work as well. So a lot of work I'm doing right now is around working with emotions and feelings and coming to a better relationship with those experiences. Because so often, you know, people unfortunately have dysfunctional relationships. And then of course, tying <laughs> that into magical work as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I mean, that's kind of what my contemporary, my, my, my current work is. And, and it's always, it's, it's informed both by the daily practices, but it's also informed by whatever I'm interested in experimenting with or learning more about or what direction I want to take the magical work that I'm going to do next. Mm -hmm. So it sounds kind of like a, um, well, it's a very eclectic approach, but also you bring in, like you said, Qigong elements of Eastern practice, and then also sort of the, um, the archangels and elements of Western practice together, right? Like you uh, definitely blend. Um, do you see that, do you see like a big distinction? Because I know there are a lot of people who they see like, you know, they see something like Qigong or perhaps Eastern practices as, oh, that's that school. And, you know, the hermeticism is that's for the West or something like that. Do you, do you see these walls there or do you see them more like they sort of seamlessly flow between each other? It's sort of the same thing in, in one way or another. How do you see that? So what practitioners of given systems will tell you is that you shouldn't mix systems together. Like I've had, I, I got into a debate about this recently on a Facebook group. I was actually, it was a, it was a, a forum that's focused on Qigong. And I was asking if people who practice Western, you know, if people who practice magic are blending that in with Qigong. And I, and I got some answers that yes, that was the case, but I had other people who say, you shouldn't do that. That takes away from the purity of the work, et cetera, et cetera. So you're going to have people who are going to always say that there are walls there. What I would say is that if there are walls there, they're porous. And they're mm -hmm. really, and what it really boils down to is that if you're going to take two different systems of practice, I mean, here's what you have to do. First, you have to understand the fundamental aspects of those systems in and of themselves. You have to learn those practices in and of themselves and develop a good mm -hmm. foundation. I, I completely agree with that. That's what anyone will tell you. 
but I think that you can blend them together. You just have to do it carefully with an eye toward paying attention to the experience and being aware, like, and, and not, and not making assumptions about how things come together, but instead really paying close attention to what's the actual experience here. Like in the case of the sphere of art, you're working with, you're, you're creating the sphere where you're, you're bringing in a specific types of energies, elemental, planetary energies, what have you, archangelic, you can choose that. And, and you're creating this rarefied space that excludes anything that is not those energies. Well, then when you're doing mm. Qigong, um, you know, you are essentially, you can essentially end up working with those same elemental energies and the planetary energies and things like that. Like when you're working with heaven and earth and you're the bridge of man, um, which in, in Qigong is kind of like there's heaven, earth, and man. Well, well, man's kind of the bridge. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what you end up finding is that you can bring those two different systems together and find that there is some type of cohesion. Again, you have to do it carefully. Um, you know, I keep, I keep notes on what I do um, and I keep track of what I'm doing. I, I try not to jump to conclusions, but when I find that time and time again, there's, consist there's consistency in the work, that tells mm -hmm. me that it is possible. You know, it's mm -hmm. not for everyone. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to naysay the people who say, well, you should stick to your own systems. I mean, they, it's, it's not necessarily bad advice and there are good reasons. If you're going to mm -hmm. experiment with different systems of, of spiritual practices, you also, you have to pay close attention because you can really mess yourself up um, if you don't do it carefully and if you don't do it right. And I, I, I say this as somebody who has, you know, experimented with Qigong techniques as an example over the years and has, has occasionally messed myself up because I went too far too fast and didn't take mm -hmm. my time at the mm -hmm. time. You know, I've, I've learned that. And, and I mean, anyone who's honest about their practice, whether they stick with a system or they blend it together is going to tell you that they've had similar experiences at some point because, you know, we all make the human error of, of wanting to run before we can crawl. Well, you have to learn, right. you have to learn those things. But if you're, but when you're blending systems, you have to especially be careful because you have to know what you're, you're doing. So it is possible, mm -hmm. but I put that caveat out there because I don't want people who are hearing this to just think, oh, well, I can just whip stuff together at random. Mm -hmm. it, it really doesn't work that right. way. It's kind of the same thing like <laughs> with, like in the case of pop culture magic, which, you know, I've, I've written about where, you know, you come up with a system of, of, of magic based around pop culture, you're still drawing on the foundational aspects of of magic that you already you've already hopefully had some experiences you're not just picking mm -hmm. up some fantasy books and saying okay well i've read harry dresden and i'm going to go ahead and whip up a magical system just based off that for one thing it won't work <laughs> that well for another thing you're deluding yourself um to some mm -hmm. degree um you, you know there's there's elements within within pop culture, fantasy, science fiction, etc., that can be useful that you can draw upon and you can mix in with you know, the principles and processes of magic, but you have to know those principles and processes. Well, how do you learn that? You, you spend some, you, you pick up the books, you learn from somebody else, what ha whatever else, and you develop a foundation of experience. I mean, I, I would say to anyone, if you want to experiment with magic, that's great, but you should really mm -hmm. only do it after you've gotten at least a couple of years of practice under your belt right. of doing what other people have done. And some people would say, what Taylor mm -hmm. Owen would say that because I'm all about experimenting with magic, but, but I'm about experimenting with magic on the basis of, of a foundation of experiences and of research and things like that. And if you're not, if you don't have those pieces in place, I don't think you have any business experimenting with magic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So having sort of the, uh, definitely getting through the fundamentals and sort of developing a consistent practice and sort of um, having like a clear understanding of fundamentals is big. And one thing I noticed that uh, I'm kind of more of a fan of your approach as well. Like I started out with, you know, Eastern practices and meditation, pranayama, and had a pretty solid foundation in those practices before I got into the Western occult stuff, right? And so I would say that helped me immensely. And um, one thing that I see in a lot of people that are, you know, just getting into this is that um, they, they will perhaps, you know, um, buy a book or explore a system for like a month or two weeks or whatever. And then it's sort of like hopping around to the next system or the next um, book or whatever, right? And sort of like, uh, 
it reminds me of a book I read a while back called Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism by Chogyam Trungpa, a Tibetan mm -hmm. Buddhist. And uh, he talks about how like uh, a lot of people, he'll see them as sort of, oh, that's the new thing is the Tibetan thing. And then they'll uh, bring it into their house like it's an antique and then marvel over it, but then go and get the next thing and the next thing. At, at the end of the day, they just have a bunch of junk because they never actually explored or appreciated the one thing that they brought home, right? And so um, he, 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 he's, he wasn't necessarily saying that it's not good to mix systems or explore other systems, but more or less that you sort of, sort of setting up a foundation and fully appreciating something first, right? Kind of what you got into, like the fundamentals and really um, using perhaps one way to as a path of attainment or to, to at least work through the monotony and the, the, um, the tedious aspects, right? Rather than jumping around on the next to get the next crackhead or something like that, right? Well, that's just it. I mean, a, a lot of people nowadays are engaged in spiritual consumerism. Like, you know, like, oh, here's the shiny, here's the, the shiny meditation practice or the shiny thing. So I, I agree with what that fellow said. I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. easy to pick up a bunch of books, take them home and, and read them and, and try stuff for a little bit and then never touch those books again. I mean, you know, I'm, uh, mm -hmm. people do that, unfortunately. But like, as an example, you know, I, I started practicing with the sphere of art. I started, I started uh, exploring it and practicing it in earnest. I, I read the book like a couple of years before I even started it. I read the book once and then I came back a few years later and I read it again. And then I was like, I'm going to memorize this because that was part of the process. You had to memorize the chance. So I memorized the chance that took me about a year to do in and of itself. Mm -hmm. You better believe that was tedious. It wasn't, you know. Mm -hmm because there was a fair number of chants. And then I ended up coming up with a couple chants of my own because it was like, I'm going to add some things to this because I saw some ways to do it. But again, I even, even that, even that, even adding stuff that was done on, on the basis of carefully reading the subject, the, mm -hmm. the original material, seeing where there could be things, reading some additional material and doing the research. And then after that mm -hmm. saying, okay, there is some possibilities here so I can go and do this stuff. I didn't even start blending Qigong into, into this, into what I was doing until um, really um, 2020, um, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was when I started to, to blend it in a bit, um, you know, and I had been doing the, the sphere of art since for, for about three years, you know, doing, mm -hmm. getting up each day and doing these chants and, and mediating and working with the alchemical substances that are part of this and all this other stuff. So it's like, you know, I, I mean, some people are in such a rush. They want to, they, they, they want, you know, that next thing or, or they want that result or whatever else. Um, and mm -hmm. so they're like, oh, I want to be in a rush. Well, my advice is slow down, slow down to hurry mm -hmm. up, you know? And what I mean by yeah. that is really take your time and learn what it is that you you are are doing you know like if you, if you buy a book for example don't just read that book once and think you know the stuff read it once mm -hmm. and then you know take a take a break for like a, a couple of weeks then come back and read it again and start working the exercises and like wor actively work the book so that the book works mm -hmm. through you as an example mm -hmm. Well, a lot of people don't do yeah. that. You know, they they buy books and and you know they read them once or whatever else and they don't really work that system or, or, or whatever is described. And the same thing is true of anything else. Like, you know, I, I mean, I've been practicing magic for almost 30 years now. And I can tell mm -hmm. you that it is not a, there's not like this, this quick, there's not this quick fix that unfortunately you, you see a lot of in mm -hmm. uh, out there. I mean, you know, I'm not going to name any names or say any books, but I mean, there <laughs> are books out uh -huh. there that, you know, where, where people are basically just trying to, simplify magic to the point where it's like oh yeah you can just you know you can just read this book and, and do this thing and you don't have to really do anything and you'll get what you want well that's not how it works and you know, people need to apply <laughs> well, <laughs> some critical right. thinking skills to what they're doing right. but all and, and, and at the same time really recognize like with anything that you that you the value you get out of it is based on what you put into it like the work that you're willing mm -hmm. to do and it doesn't mean you have to work yeah. hard it just means that you have to be willing to put the time and investment in and i, I don't think that's said enough today mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it really needs to be said more often yeah definitely i agree i think that um it's somewhat of a byproduct of society to write with marketing and um you know people wanting 
anybody who's achieved weight loss or build a business or anything along those lines, they would laugh about, oh, you just read this book and it's magically, you know, you don't have to put in any work and any effort and go through any struggle and face any of your own inner demons or whatever. It's, it's laughable, right? But uh, for somebody who perhaps, you know, picks up a book or just gets into something like this, it could be, it's very psychologically appealing to say that, yeah, just this this book and you don't really have to do <laughs> a quick fix as you're saying like a magic pill or whatever right like that's um uh, i mean i think that's a sort of a byproduct of the current society right like sort of being inpatient and you want your amazon prime same day i also want my i want my <laughs> i want my magical attainment now you know <laughs> so that's sort of that's sort of mindset right it is and i i mean it's in it's in it's 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 but it's, but it's not even it's not even something that that's really all that unusual i mean you go back into to the times of antiquity and you see the same kind of thinking process in place like mm -hmm. you know if you you look at the pgm for example you have these different rituals and stuff for for things that people want so it's not like it's not like it's even that unusual it's just human behavior mm -hmm. but you have to but this is where i think you know people need to recognize the limitations of human behavior and be able to say okay well you know if i have this i want it now attitude am i really going to get anything out of this whereas if i'm willing to put some time in and, and some effort in and i'm willing to really dedicate myself to this how might this transform my life and and i can guarantee that you know if you put like a, a year's worth of effort into something who you were the year before is going to definitely be different from who you are now as a result of that year. Now, mm -hmm. you know, add in, you know, a few more years or a couple decades or whatever else. And, and, you know, you know, the person you were is not the person you're going to be. And, and that's, and that's an important thing to remember, but it's, it's an, it's a path of evolution. Well, that's, that's true of living life in general too. I mean, you know, we live our lives and, and, and there we go. But I think that, again like if you're going to engage in some type of practice of some type or another you have to understand that there is a discipline involved it's not just something that's done for the sake of of you know that quick fix and, and a lot of magic is admittedly a quick fix kind of situation people do spells like i had a problem coming in my life i need to reactively solve it i'm not saying there's anything wrong with that it can be useful for that but mm -hmm. you get serious about this work and you start to realize there's a lot more going on than just, you know, reactively solving problems that come into your life. Right, right, right. So sort of getting into the, um, rather than putting on the next Band-Aid and the next Band-Aid actually getting in there and, you know, working out the infection, so to speak, right? Like actually fixing the problem rather than having to jump from quick fix to quick fix. But, but sometimes obviously you do need a quick fix, like you said, right? Like... You know, if you get shot on the leg or something, you know, you need you need to get the bullet out right now, right? So, um, yeah, well, it, sometimes a quick fix is exactly what you need. But like, let's say you have the same problem occurring again and again in your life, then mm -hmm. it's time to figure out what's going on that's causing that problem. And I, I, I will say this about about the problem that the problems that people encounter in their lives. There's one thing that all of your problems have in common, and it's you. It's you, the person. Right. You know, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm, and, and I'm not saying that in a sense of saying like, oh, you're responsible for that problem per se. Like it's all your fault that you have this problem keep coming up in one form or another. But what I'm saying is be willing to at least take on the responsibility of looking at your part in that problem. If, for example, you find mm -hmm. that you're always, you, you know, that you're always getting into relationships with people that are dramatic and messy and everything else. Well, I mean, some of that's on the other person, but some of it's on you sure. as well. Sure, sure. So seeing the uh, sort of the underlying patterns and energies that come up in your life, uh, that's, a, that's the way I look at it too. It's like somewhat, um, you're talking about relationships, people can be kind of like a mirror, right? Like, like if the same things keep happening over and over again, and you keep blaming, <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's their fault, it's their fault. But like the same patterns keep coming up. Oftentimes, people are just sort of a mirror of your own mindset and um, psychology or the way you're coming off or the way you're expressing yourself, right? So exactly yeah. that. I mean, I, I, I mean, here's, here's a bit of advice. This is relationship advice, it's not a call to advice, but it's good. It's, it's good mm -hmm. advice. Nonetheless, if you meet somebody and you find that they're always, that they're, that they never take any responsibility, they're always blaming the other people for why the relationships that they were in didn't work run in the opposite direction, because you know what, <laughs> they're not going to change with you and, and maybe spend some time figuring mm -hmm. out why you were drawn to that in the first place. 
Right, right, right. Exactly. No, definitely, definitely. Okay. Um, you mentioned that, you know, you've been doing this a while, these practices a while, and uh, a lot of people, you know, they get into the occult or, you know, Eastern practices, but most people don't end up writing courses or making, you know, online courses or books, writing books and whatnot, right? So um, I'm kind of curious what led you or inspired you to initially start writing books on this. And um, I did look at, I think your website is called Magical Experiments. Is that right? Did I yeah, magicalexperiments.com. Right? Um, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I also noticed you teach a lot of like, um, uh, a lot of practical stuff, right? Like understanding the process of magic and um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of interesting courses on there that people can check out, but what, uh, what initially got you to creating content in this area? So, um, I was, uh, I, I started, I, I was, it was back in my, when I was getting my master's in English, I was on the E-list back in the day. I'd been on the Z-list, um, which is a chaos magic list for those of you who don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. Um, some people will probably know what it is, but some people might not. And then, um, I was on a bunch of other listservs and I remember this, this one guy was, um, uh, who went by the, the name Mecha Kyrios. Uh, he was, um, he said he wanted to write a book on entities. Now, I, I've always been a bit of a writer. I've, I've, you know, I've been, I, I was writing fiction back then. I hadn't published any of it. Um, and of course, I was writing, I was in an academia pursuing a master's degree. So, of course, I was doing writing, you know, papers and stuff like that. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so, and, 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 you know, I was, I was sharing, you know, my ideas and thoughts on magic as well, you know, on these different e-lists and stuff. So when he said that he wanted to write a book on how to create magical entities and he wanted to know if anyone wanted to, you know, co-author it and help and help do the experiments, I, I volunteered. And so I ended up uh, co-writing creating magical entities back in 2003. And that's what got me mm -hmm. into writing uh books but you, you know part of it too was that i've always just had my own interest in experiments and things like that like i said you know i mean i started practicing and in the first couple of years i didn't really experiment but after that i started to experiment and, and stuff like that and i saw that most people out there that were sharing stuff on magic they weren't really talking about it in the way that i was so i thought you know hey i've mm -hmm. i'm i've got these ideas and, and stuff like that so then i started I, I wrote my first solo book pop culture magic back in 2003 and published it in 2004 and then um and then followed that with space time magic and inner alchemy and, and ever since then i've continued writing um books on magic and you know at this point i mean i i still write it for the same reason i wrote it initially and it's it's that i'm I'm just endlessly fascinated and curious mm -hmm. about how the world works. And I like sharing my thoughts and practices and processes. And in the case of mm -hmm. magic, um, you know, I, I, I've, I've, I actually have a, a series of books called, you know, called the How Magic Works series. And the first book is called, aptly called The Process of Magic. And then, of course, I have courses as well. And, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, again, it comes out of this thing of I, I want to share from a different perspective, you know, a, a process oriented perspective, you know, like here's, here's my observations on how magic seems to work and, and what you can do to get consistent results and things like that. So I put mm -hmm. that together. And then in terms of teaching, it's, it's kind of the same thing. It's, it, it's this basis. Now I, I, I will say, you know, I got into, I had originally, when I originally published my books, I went with a, a small press, um, a Manian press mm -hmm. and, and, um, and I published my books that way. I didn't get into self-publishing until 2018. And, mm -hmm. um, and at the time I was working at a call center. I had been self-employed for 11 years or for, for nine years, but you know, I, uh, things didn't work out with my businesses and I ended up having to go back to work. And mm -hmm. I decided on a whim to go ahead and self-publish, um, the process of magic and then space time magic foundations and see how they did. And I realized, oh my gosh. I'm making more money selling just these two books than I am with my traditional publisher. So I took all the rights mm. back to my books and I self-published them. And, and really the, 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 the goal of it was I wanted to get, I wanted to get back to being self-employed and living on my own schedule because call center work is mm -hmm. miserable work. You're dealing with cranky customers <laughs> and stuff like that. And I didn't want to do that right. for the rest of my life. Um, you know, I mean, it was, mm -hmm. 
I, I found that job because it was any port in the storm kind of a situation. Like I needed to, I needed to be able to pay the bills and, and that was the job I was able to find and I was grateful for it, but I want to mm -hmm. do it for the rest of my life. And I really don't like working for other people. Sure. And so, sure. Mm -hmm. and so you know, and, I, and I've always taught classes to some degree or another, like I presented at conferences and stuff, but I had, I had learned a fair amount about online marketing. And so I decided to start creating some online courses and to continue writing my books. And the beauty of that was that in um, July of 2020, I was able to quit my daytime job because I now make enough money to, um, you know, pay the bills and, 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 and still be able to do what I want to do. Um, and, and so that's mm -hmm. kind of, where that comes from, but it's also because I genuinely love to teach and share my perspectives. Um, I'm I'm a bit of a, a maverick in the occult community. I, I I go my own my own path, and I think that that's important too. Because not mm -hmm. knocking all the other people out there writing books or whatever else, but most of the stuff out there is pretty conventional. Um, it's mm -hmm. good stuff and it's important and everything else, but I like presenting a, a different perspective on magic an experimental perspective. And that's really what, you know, my classes and everything else is geared towards. So that's pretty mm -hmm. much what decided me on that. And, and so I'm continuing to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You felt like you had a different angle or something to bring to the table that perhaps wasn't really as much available at the time or even now, right? like having your own experimental approach and um, just showing people a different way to do, to approach the subject, right? So um, I'm curious though, like uh, it's different learning something. I mean, anybody who's um, taught a subject as I've taught some other, I've never, I'm not a magic teacher or a meditation teacher or anything, but um, I've taught other subjects and learning something and attaining something versus teaching it can be a lot different, right? Because each student has their own, challenges or, um, you know, they bring in their own, um, you know, predispositions, do they have their own blocks or whatnot, right? And so have you, what, what have you noticed, like, learning and, you know, your path versus, like, now that you teach these subjects, what, um, you know, what, what kind of challenges or what kind of, uh, you know, what, what kind of things came up in that regard? I'm curious. So I self-taught myself magic. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, like I picked up books and I read them and I basically, I basically learned magic that way. I had a couple of mentors over the years, but most of my experiences with my initial experiences with would-be mentors was pretty negative. I mean, I remember the first person <laughs> was, I was another pimply high school kid at that, but he, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> was going to teach me some, and it wasn't the same person who introduced me to magic either, but he was going to teach me. <laughs> who's going to teach me some stuff about magic and a week, a, a week into this, this thing of teaching me, he, he calls me up and he gravely tells me that he can't teach me magic. And I'm like, why not? And he <laughs> says, because you have no soul. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I'm like, wow. Okay. So I hung up and, and for like about a half hour, I'm like distressed about this. And then I was like, you know what? <laughs> this guy's afraid of me. That's why. And that was what I came to because I just had this fierce hunger for learning magic and I was self-teaching myself mm -hmm. and I think he was intimidated. So I, that, mm -hmm. that was the answer I came to because as far as I can tell, I do have a soul. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe <laughs> I don't, but you know, I seem to be doing pretty well regardless. So, you know, right. and then, and then um, uh -huh. my other mentor experience was when, it, when that was, was, wasn't so good. It was in my early twenties. Um, and it, it was it was it was with this guy who belonged to the temple of psychic youth no less so chaos magician no less I was telling him about mm -hmm. some ideas i had around experimenting with pop culture magic and he stuffily told me that wasn't real magic now he mm -hmm. did me one favor he introduced me to the books of, of william g gray so i'll always be thankful to him for that and i started reading mm -hmm. those books but i was just like this guy lacks imagination and creativity and, and, you know, he was like, he was 30 years old. So, you know, a bit older than me, but he already had this, this kind of world weary attitude. Like he knew everything about magic. I'll tell you, I'm 44 now and I don't have that attitude. So, I, I mean, I don't, I, I think, you know, I, I don't know if he still practices or not. If he does, you know, I hope he's, he's found that love for magic that he clearly lacked at that time. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so, you know, I self-taught myself now, now eventually I did find, um, some other, a couple other mentors, like I've worked with Robert 
or RJ Stewart, Robert Stewart, um, and taken some of his courses. And I definitely consider him to be a mentor uh, as well as a friend. Um, I'm, I'm learning uh, a lot about Qigong from um, Bruce Francis through his Dow Space Live program right now, since nobody can meet in person. Mm. Um, so that's been mm -hmm. pretty cool. But, you know, the thing that I've kind of come to realize with both my negative and positive experiences with teachers is that, you know, teachers to some degree or another are limited by their own limitations, by their own mm -hmm. preconceptions. Mm -hmm. You know, like RJ, RJ and I wouldn't agree on pop culture magic, you know, like he, you know, mm -hmm. I read some of his books sometimes and I'm like, okay, RJ, here you are going on about the media again, whatever. And, you know, I just kind of <laughs> chuckle to myself and accept that. I mean, that's him and, 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 and it's, it reflects his generation and everything else. Mm -hmm. But for me, I'm like, you know, th that's not how I am. So, so with my books and with the classes, I've always tried to approach things from a perspective of encouraging people to think for themselves and to come up with their own answers. And so I always say to people like, you know, don't take my word for it, take it with a grain of salt. And it's how I teach my courses because I remember those mm -hmm. experiences and how crushing uh, early on, not so much later on, but how crushing early on it was to have somebody basically try and naysay you and tell you what, what you were doing wasn't working. And, mm. and I get it, you know, sometimes you, you know, sometimes people kind of have to be like, well, look, I'm a gatekeeper here. I got to say this because this person's going down the wrong path or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think there's better ways to say that. I mean, for, for example, me saying, you know, look, I think you need to get a couple of years of experience under your belt is a better way of saying that than just saying to somebody, don't do this. You don't know what you're talking right. about. So right. I always try to approach things from a place of critical inquiry in my teaching mm -hmm. um, because that's, mm -hmm. that's how I've learned, but also from a perspective of what is possible and at the same time really encouraging people to think for themselves and, and to find their own answers and to not take my word for it. I mean, at the end of the mm -hmm. day, each person is their own best teacher, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you're going to learn more from your mistakes then you're going to learn from somebody else. I mean, I, I can tell you all the mistakes I've made and hopefully you will learn something from those mistakes but and, 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 mm -hmm. and, and avoid them. But the truth of the matter is you're going to go and you're going to do stuff and, and, and you're going to learn best from that. So that's, that's how I approach my teaching is I really encourage people to take what I've shared and, and, and try it, but then, you know, make it their own. Don't be afraid to experiment, try things out, see what happens and, and discover for themselves because the best way you're truly going to learn is if, if you do the work yourself and you really do it from a perspective of how can I make this my own? And I think that that's mm -hmm. something that, again, is, is not said enough um, or, or, or really mm -hmm. advocated for, but it's something that should be advocated for because, you know, yes, we can say there's this tried and true way of doing things, but there's nothing wrong with questioning that tried and true way of doing things and trying to find out for yourself if you can do it a better way. And when people mm -hmm. discourage that, what they're really discouraging is the evolution of a discipline and the evolution exactly, of, yeah. of spiritual practices or, or any kind of practice. And that and, mm -hmm. and down that path lies stagnation, which is a worse sin in my mind than, than experimenting with something and finding out that, well, it really doesn't work. Okay, yeah, maybe you, right. you, you, you came up with an idea and you tried something and it didn't work, but at least you found that out for yourself and it might inspire you to come up with something different and mm -hmm. down the line. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you're sort of um, uh, acting as a facilitator or empowering people to sort of, you know, get the fundamentals down and whatnot, but also to think for themselves and sort of connect with their own inner teacher and have the ability ability to um, sort of forge their own path and uh, eventually go off and do their own experimentation and whatnot, right? Like you're sort of, um, uh, you know, so they're not, they take your courses, but it's not like the end of they should, they should be relying on you for all the answers and, you know, things along those lines. You're sort of um, attempting to get them, you know, I guess you'd say schooled in the fundamentals and able to think on their own feet and sort of sort of teaching them to walk so that they can sort of choose their direction. Would that be, is that kind of an accurate assessment, would you say? Yeah, I, I mean, I would hope that at the end of the day, they're not going to limit themselves to just what I have to say or share. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'll, I'll use this as a good example. I, I had this conversation once with a person. This person had been practicing magic for a couple of years. And I said, I, oh, I'm really looking forward to learning a lot from you. 
And, and, and she said, what am I going to have to teach you? I've only been practicing magic for two years. And I said, I could learn a lot from you. I mm. mean, because you have that freshness of perspective that I don't have at this point in my life. I've been practicing this for a long time. You might ask questions or think about things in a different way than I would. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the thing. You're like, you know, no matter how much you know, you have to be willing to do two things. One, challenge what you know to discover what you can learn because what you know is a blinder. You know, you, mm -hmm. you, knowing something doesn't necessarily mean it's true. It just means that from based on your experience, this is what you know. So challenge it. Well, how do you challenge mm -hmm. that? You, you keep yourself open to fresh perspectives, things like that. So, you know, I, I would want my students to do the same thing that I do, which is to challenge what they know, challenge what they've, you know, um, what they know by discovering what they can learn by experimenting and, and exploring and finding their own answers, because my answers may not be the answers that work for you. That doesn't mean you can't get something of value from me, but mm -hmm. it does mean that, you know, you have to ultimately own your own spiritual path and your own work. And if you don't own that, it's really hard to do that. Mm, oh, that's a good point. I'm curious uh, because I, I totally agree. Like, as you mentioned, you connected with people who are, you know, kind of new to this and stuff, and they're bringing sort of a fresh perspective, but also sort of maybe more, they came in at a different point. So they are sort of in a different way of looking at this, right? Like, I'm curious how you see, or from your perspective, since you said you started um, practicing in the 90s, is that right? Like early mm -hmm. 90s, I think you said. Yeah. Um, how have you seen this whole like current change? Because at least from now, you know, what I see on internet message words, I don't know if that's necessarily an accurate re reflection in some ways, but um, on Facebook and stuff like that, you see now it's almost like people are very focused on this like grimoire and like older is better. And, you know, it's sort of, um, it's sort of a scholarly approach, I guess you would say, or they're going back to like, um, you know, we just got to keep going to the older grimoires and the older grimoires is sort of um, looking back uh, mm -hmm. approach, I guess you would call it. I don't know exactly how to describe it, but um, I don't, I don't think that was as present in your, when you started learning it, right? Like, in the 90s, it sounds like you're part of that Z list, like the chaos magic. It's more to more experimentation, more um, was it not not necessarily denying past grimoires or past traditions, but sort of um, more free flowing, right? Whereas now, it seems like there's a lot more um, focus on like older traditions or um, maybe 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 do you do you see it in that way? Like maybe when you started out, it was like newer or fresh experimentation was a little bit more encouraged, and now is it? How do you see things? How do you how do you see the direction that you know things have went since you've been in, involved in this practice? Sure. Well, in the 1990s, um, I would say that you know you definitely did see more free flow um, and and more of an approach that was that was more experimental in some ways. And the reason why is that in a, in a lot of sense, I mean, the occult community was was more underground at that point too. You know, it mm -hmm. wasn't. I mean, really. If you think about the occult community in general, there's 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 probably been an, there's, there's probably been an occult community of some form or another since like the 19th or 18th century, probably even back before that to some degree or another in some ways. But in terms of just the sheer number of people practicing magic, you really didn't start to see that pick up until the latter part of the 20th century, and even then, it was ca carefully kept under wrap a lot, wraps a lot of the time. The 1990s is when you started to see a real occult revival in the sense that it started to become a bit more accepted and mm -hmm. then and then a little bit more in the 2000s and then in the last decade or so I think it's just become a lot more accepted you know there's more and more people practicing the stuff there's more pagan conventions occult conventions things like that mm -hmm. and I think that you know uh you'd you, you're definitely seeing a, a, a revival around the grimoire traditions. And there's a number of reasons for that. I think, you know, part of it is that people want to have a sense of power in their lives. I mean, you know, they, and, 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 and it's like, okay, well, I can work with this goetic demon and this goetic demon, you know, I can bind this goetic demon to my will and make it serve me. <laughs> I, I will add that I don't agree with that approach. My, my own approach mm -hmm. is much more of a relation, relational approach to working with spirits. And I write about mm -hmm. that in my book, Walking with Spirits. Like, it's not, it's not anthropomorphized the way that so much of the spiritual practices are. In some ways, it's actually kind of taking it back even further because, in a sense, it's mm -hmm. like, well, how do you relate to this 
to these spirits from an experiential perspective instead of from a, a perspective of anthropomorphizing them and making everything conveniently occur in your you know, in a form that's, that's, you know, sane for humanity and, and, and speaks your native language, whatever that is and all that other stuff. But I get it, you know, why people do what mm -hmm. they're doing. And I don't, I'm not gonna say it's wrong. I just think that there's, mm -hmm. there's alternate paths again, but I do see mm -hmm. this. I mean, and I, and I, and I think a large part of it really comes right down to people want to have a sense of power. People mm -hmm. want to have a sense of control in their lives. And, and certainly, I mean, in the last year, if anything, we have we have experienced the opposite of that with the pandemic, you know. And so I get mm -hmm. why, in some sense, people are even skewing over that direction even more. Um, mm -hmm. And so I see, you know, people who would be getting into this now. I mean, I think that you know they're they're kind of getting into that. And I think the danger of it comes back to what we were talking about earlier, like with the teaching, is that you get into this one true wayism. And I've seen this mm, sure. you know, where people are mm -hmm. like, you know, this is the one true way and other approaches don't work or they're not as effective. And, and to some degree, that's always been present. I'm not saying it hasn't, but I think it's risen even more of late. And again, that's where I'm going to advocate, you know, use your critical thinking skills, go and, mm -hmm. and have some experiences and, and question what you read and what you learn from people, me included. Mm -hmm. You know, don't, mm -hmm. you know, don't take, take it all with a lick of salt because that's, that's what, mm -hmm. what's really needed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I hope, I really hope that we don't go down, we don't go down the path of the occult to the point where people aren't experimenting or, or trying things out differently. Certainly, um, I've always been kind of on the edge of the occult community. Um, so, you know, I've always been there, been kind of on that edge and exploring things out there. Um, and I do find it heartening that to some degree, I see more people coming out that way. So I, you know, I've hoped that that will continue because I think that, you know, we need to have, we need to have on the one side, the people that are the purest that do things a certain mm -hmm. way. We, there is a place for them. And, and, and I would never say otherwise, there is a place for them because of what they represent. And because, you know, if something's worked in the past, there's, there's probably something to it. It's worth exploring, but mm -hmm. there's just as much value and there's just as much need for a voice in the opposite the direction that says, well, how can we evolve these practices or how can we change this? Or what could we mm -hmm. do differently than what has already been done? And mm -hmm. so we need that just as much. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I agree. I think it's sort of a, a sort of nature too, right? Like the pendulum will swing one way into, you know, forget the past and it's all about the new, right? And then it'll swing back like, no, let's go back to our traditions and roots and, you know, uh, purism and whatnot. I think it's, it's kind of a pendulum swinging back and forth, right? But ideally it sort of corrects itself or it sort of comes to a middle ground when you have, you know, like you said, you have a lot of experimentation and people um, trying out new things, but then at the same time, people really, uh, what would you say, like re um, researching old texts or um, doing more scholarly work in that regard, or, you know, bringing back older traditions at the same time. They can be complementary. It doesn't necessarily need to be one versus the other, right? Like, you know, everyone's bringing something to the table, I think. So as long as, like you said, you know, sometimes the loudest voices rise to the top, right? So, where you have people saying you can only do it one way. I think um, maybe for somebody who's new or somebody who's just, you know, jumping into these things, they might come across those voices and that could be detrimental in a way or it could be limiting or dogmatic, right? It can be very dogmatic and limiting because it it basically doesn't encourage them to discover for themselves. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's like when I've encountered people that'll basically say, well, you have to do it this way or it won't work or you have to stick with this system and and that's the only way mm -hmm. you can do it and it's mm -hmm. like well but but is that really true do you know that for sure and <laughs> right because people say it with such confidence right and so that can be um you know it's like marketing right if you say something with extreme confidence then um you know, a lot of people will be sort of drawn into that, even if there's no substance behind it, or it's not even a good product, right? Like marketing it up the right way can sort of lead people astray, right? Right. Well, I mean, to, to put it another way, there are a lot of people out there that are really good at marketing, but don't know how to run a business. Just because you're mm -hmm. good at marketing doesn't mean you know how to run a business. And it's the same thing with, with anything else. Just because you 
you've got the specific path that you're on, I mean, hey, great, kudos to you for, for doing the work and everything else, but don't assume that you know the answer for other people. You know, give people the space mm. and the grace to discover their own answers, because when you do that, you're, you're, really, you're really empowering them to be their own spiritual authority and i think that that's really if, if if you know if someone was to say to me well what's the purpose of magic i would say it's to discover your own authority it's not it's to discover your own sovereignty it's to discover who you are and what you are but it's not to necessarily get in the way of other people and i think a lot of times what i see and have always seen in magic i mean it's not even just a reflection of contemporary times but you know when people have a desire for power Sometimes that desire for power is just as much about disempowering other people as it is about having power. And I think that's the wrong approach to take. If, if you, mm. you know, true, true empowerment is, is being able to be confident enough in yourself that you don't need to disempower other people because you can basically be like, Hey, I know what I'm doing and, and everything else. I'm willing to challenge, challenge it and learn but I don't need to tell other people what to do. I don't need to disempower them or keep them under control. I can, I can encourage them. And that's where, you, you know, that's really what my path and my work is about. It's about encouraging people to empower themselves without trying to take that away from them. Because uh, genuine, if, if, if we want to see a, an evolution, not just in our spiritual paths, but really an evolution in how we live our lives and approach the way the, the world and everything else, we have to change our relationship with each other mm -hmm. and with power and with all those other things. We have to change it to one that is more, that, that is less about trying to control other people and is more about discovering for ourselves our true potential. Right. Yeah. I, I like that approach. That's really good. Um, especially, you know, like I said, when you log onto the internet, you see a lot of, uh, you know, it's with anything you're, you're going to see dogmatic approaches or um, I think I think a lot of it also has to do with not only what you were saying with the, the power and like sort of um, what would you say, I don't necessarily say manipulation, but to, to some degree, but it's also it can be intellectually lazy, right? Like it's sort of like if somebody say somebody's saying a Christian or something and this is the right way and you have to believe in the Bible, this is the only way that you can, you know, um, connect with the divine. And so they come in with that sort of um, background, right? And then they, maybe they start exploring on their own and they get into the occult. And then you have similar voices in the occult too, right? Like this is the only way to practice, you know, magic. And this is the, the purest approach. So I think it's sort of in a degree uh, remnants of that sort of same intellectual laziness, I guess you'd say, right? Like, cause you don't need to think anymore. This is the one way. Um, you don't need to take in new information or try new things because you have the answers, right? It can be kind of a, uh, I don't know, a form of like a, uh, it's, it's sort of a remnant of that similar dogmatism that was perhaps, you know, um, present in their early life, right? It is. I mean, I mean and, and I've seen it. I, I mean, I had a person once who kind of was like, who who kind of got upset with me because I was talking about working with spirits in one of my classes and I talked about how like with the angels you know that I worked with that there was basically an expectation that I would do something in return for the work that they were doing with me and this person was like well that never happened with me you know they didn't mm -hmm. you know they just they were just supposed to serve blah 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 and I'm like well I mean that's your experience but this is my experience you know mm -hmm. don't you know, and this person acted like they knew the answer. And I'm like, it, it, it's like, don't invalidate my, don't invalidate my path and my work because you don't agree with it. And I won't invalidate yours. I mean, I, I, you know, my experience with, with the angels and archangels that I was working with was like, Hey, we're, we're willing to help you out, but we want, we have some work for you to do too. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this other person was like, well, you know, like I just called on this angel and they did and they didn't ask for anything in return. It's like, okay, well, that's great. I mean, you know, that, that's not my experience, but I'm glad that that worked for you. But, you know, it wasn't, that wasn't for me. And it's like, you know, you, you, you only have, you, you really only have the answers for yourself. You don't have it for anyone else. Mm. And sometimes you don't even have the answers for yourself. I mean, I can't tell you how many times <laughs> I've done stuff and I've been left with more questions than answers. And I think, right. I think really, you know, what the occult community needs in general is a good dose of humbleness, 
like humility, Mm -hmm. like, you know, have the grace to acknowledge you don't have all the answers and that, you know, yes, maybe you can do some impressive stuff, but that you're, that you're just as capable of, of making mistakes and being stupid and doing things that you shouldn't do and hurting people mm-hmm. and all those other things that, you know, is, is part of that human process and being hurt. I mean, you know, if we were, if, if, if we're just, if we're willing to be humble and I'm not saying humble for the sake of like false humility or, or, or anything <laughs> like that, but rather just to simply acknowledge like, look, I don't have the answers for you. I have questions and I have some ideas and I can share that with you, but you're still going to have to find your own answers. And sometimes Mm -hmm. I don't even have the answers for myself. It could go a long way toward helping people just be a lot kinder to each other. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Totally agree with that. Um, Okay. So I noticed that like, like on your site, you have a lot of courses and um, you know, you have a lot of books out and everything. And so is there, if somebody's you know wants to check out your work and they really like what you're saying here, they like your approach and um, sort of um, you know very open-minded, experimental, and but yet giving you the foundations, right? Like you you have a course called the Process of Magic. Would that be a good place to start, or what would you recommend somebody just who's you know just discovering your work? Where would you advise them to start out? What would be a good like foundational um, uh, place to start out from? So, so the process of magic course is actually a course that's for somebody that's an utter newbie that's never practiced magic before, only done a little bit. So, you know, Mm -hmm. majority of people probably have some experience with magic. So, I mean, I would recommend that course if you've never done any magic at all and you happen to be listening to this podcast and you're like, huh, the Taylor Elwood guy. But I'm assuming most of your listeners actually have some experience. Uh, And that might be a a false assumption, but I'm just going to go with it anyway. (laughs) Um, I would say... um, you might start with my book, The Process of Magic, which is actually a much more focused approach, a, a, a much more focused exploration of how magic works. Or check out my book, Inner Alchemy. But I mean, really, I, I mean, it just depends on what your interests are. I mean, if you want to learn how my approach to working with spirits, check out the Walk with Spirits series. If you want to learn my approach to space time magic, then check out the space time magic series or whatever. You know, I've written, I've written a number of different books that are really reflective of the experimental approach, but they're also based around, you know, in part, you know, people's interests. I mean, you want to learn about, for example, um, how to integrate magic and art together. Well, then check out my book, The Magic of Art. You know, it, it's really designed mm-hmm. around like whatever your interests are. Um, and, mm-hmm. and, and again, part, part of that's just because I have so many wide ranging interests. So I like to explore different topics and things like that so that's that would be my suggestion and, and and same for the courses take a look at the courses and if you see something that interests you go ahead and take it and see what happens okay cool are there any currently are you working on any new books or new courses that uh do you have anything in the works coming up well i just finished my latest fiction book called tales of the zombie apocalypse call center which is actually going to be available um, <laughs> in the near very near funny. future but that's that's fiction i mean if you if you're into zombie apocalypses and stuff and you want a funny take on it then check that series check out my zombie apocalypse call center series um but i'm actually getting ready to work on my next fiction or non-fiction book um and it's called it's going to be titled uh inner alchemy of emotions and it really explores our relationship with emotions uh it's 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 very much driven around doing internal work around emotions and how to how to be present with them in a more in a, in a healthier way um mm-hmm. and, and i will say this book is reflective of my own hard-earned <laughs> experience around <laughs> it because i have not i have definitely had to do some work sometimes around emotions um but mm-hmm. it's it's really going to be exploring that and then later this year 2021 um, I am going to be working on a sequel to my Wealth Magic book, as well as working on um, Walking with um, Elementals, which is the Elemental Magic book. And then beyond that, I don't know what else I'm going to be doing nonfiction-wise, it, um, at least as far as the occult goes, because it just depends. I mean, I'm always, I've am always i got a number mm-hmm. of different book projects. I want to finish up the Zombie Apocalypse series. I want to write, write a book on um, book launching and how to, how to do that successfully. So, you know, oh, cool. I'm going to be doing a number of different things, but those three books are in the works to one degree or another. 
Okay, cool. Yeah. So it sounds like uh, you already do have a lot of, a lot of in the works and, you know, kind of, you kind of take an organic approach and what interests you have at the time and what you're exploring, right. And putting that out there. So that sounds, uh, yeah, it sounds natural and organic. Um, I'm very curious, like I just recently started, um, you mentioned that you write fiction and uh, I, I read a lot of fiction, you know, earlier in my life. And then I kind of just, I don't know if I felt like it started feeling like a waste of time or I got bored with it. And I mostly, you know, started reading more spiritual texts or psychology or, you know, anything mm -hmm. nonfiction, really biographies and things along these lines. Right. But uh, it hasn't been until very recently that I've started um, diving back into fiction. And so what um, I, I feel like there are probably a lot of people like me as well that sort of got bored with fiction or maybe see, don't see as much value in it. Or there are mm -hmm. people who, you know, only read fiction, of course, too, right? But uh, what would you say is the, like, the value in fiction? Why, you know, for people who sort of overlook it, what would you say is the value in reading, um, mixing it, mixing it up your reading with, uh, you know, fiction and novels and whatnot? So first, I'm going to tell you that I actually went through a period of time, just like you did, where I just read nonfiction mm -hmm. for a while. Now, part of that was because of academia. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I was, I, I got a master's in uh, English and then I pursued a PhD for a while. I ended up ultimately not, not going through with it because I realized academia wasn't a good fit. But, um, you know, I read lots of nonfiction, but even after for a while, I just read nonfiction. Um, and then I found that at a certain point, I was like, man, I, I, I like reading, but I, I want to read something. I want to read some brain candy. I want to read something light and fluffy, mm. you know? And so like, you know, like a comic book or some fiction. And, mm -hmm. and of course, I mean, I, I've always been, a, like I said, I'm a bit of a geek and a nerd anyway. So, I mean, I've always, I've always liked fiction. Um, but, but, you know, I, I just went through a period where I didn't read it. Not because I found it even boring or anything. I just, I just, you know, got, got sucked into other stuff. And, mm -hmm. and so I would say the value of fiction really is just that it gives you a chance to have some fun and imagine and, and everything else without having to be like so serious. Like I, I love fiction. Mm -hmm. I'm reading Battleground by um, Jim Butcher right now, which is the latest book in the Dresden Files series. And mm -hmm. I mean, some of it I'm reading because, you know, you know all of it, I read fiction in part because I'm all, also on the lookout for like, you know, is there, are there ideas I can turn into magical workings here because of my interest in pop mm. culture magic? So there's always, there is that aspect to it, but I'm, I, that's just the way I am. But, um, but, you know, I'm also, I also read it for fun. And I, I mean, there's just something fun about reading a book where it's a bit nonsensical or crazy or whatever, like science fiction or whatever else. And just having some, giving your, your brain a chance to just relax and have some fun. You know, we can't be serious all the time. And, and unfortunately, it is way too easy to be serious in this world. And, and so I think, you know, having a sense of novelty and fun and introducing that into what you read can be good for you. And it helps you appreciate that nonfiction better because then you're kind of like, oh, yeah. I, you know, and I, I actually, one of the things that I love to do is... Um, I try to read every day, but there will be there there will be like on the weekend. I will usually take part of an hour, late afternoon evening, and I will just spend like a couple hours reading, and I will just bounce from book to book to book because I'm reading about uh, twelve different books at, at a given time. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I, I don't read I don't read a singular book anymore. Um, I haven't been able to do that for years um, mm -hmm. because I used to be able to do that like when I was a, a kid and a teenager early 20 something, but then I got into academia and I also um, I did a bit of a magical experiment around how I process information. And, uh, and so that, that changed the way. So now I find that I kind of have to bounce from book to book to book. Um, but I actually find that it, it helps me because it creates a holistic perspective. And so, I mean, I, but, but I mix fiction in with that and it just helps me enjoy the, the nonfiction even more. And so I'll spend a couple hours just reading and, until the cup brimeth over and then I'll stop and I'll be like, wow, I got a lot from that. And it, it just makes me feel happy inside. So that's what I would recommend. Read some fiction to lighten up that load. It'll make you happy inside. Trust me. Or don't. definitely it's, it brings good uh, balance to you for sure. And uh, even, I mean, you can also read fiction that uh, surprisingly, you know, a lot of people, they read uh, occult books or something for, you know, changes in mindsets or looking at things from a different angle, but fiction can also do the same thing while 
you know, certain books, you read them and they'll give you a whole new perspective on things and whatnot, while at the same time being a lot lighter, not not like, um, it's not like you're hanging on underlining every, every you know, all the important sentences, like, you know, like studying some sort of a cult book, but it can be a lighter, more fun approach to even changing, you know, changing mindsets and seeing things from a different light, right? So, uh, sure. yeah, I think fiction can be really good. I, uh, I'm glad that I recently started getting back into it, to be honest. It's been very good to bring a little bit more balance, you know? So, yeah. What are you reading? Um, actually, I read a friend of mine. He writes, recently I just ordered a book from a friend of mine. He writes, um, it's actually a cult fiction too. So that's what, I, what I've what uh, been diving into recently. And not all of it is occult topics, but a lot of his writing, he um uh, interweaves sort of experiences that he has, you know, in occult experiences into the narrative or into oh, the, cool. you know, it, yeah. So it's, it's pretty fun. It's pretty cool uh, stuff. I'm enjoying uh, exploring his writing. So it's been pretty cool. And uh, yeah, I got a lot of um, uh, different stuff on the table. I'm actually here in Korea. And so I'm trying to dive into some more uh, actually local authors like Korean fiction as well. So um yeah, I mean, my Korean's okay. I can I can read books in Korean, but there are uh, English translations as well. So what's kind of good is if you learn another language, and uh, as you mentioned comic books earlier, right? It's such a good way to learn another language where you can buy a comic book, like a translation of a comic book, and then, um, you know, one in your original language, one in the other language. And not only is it fun to read, but also it's a really good way to learn. It's a very fun and uh, interactive way to learning rather than a dry textbook approach, you know? So oh, I'll have to keep that in mind. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe get your uh, books translated, right? <laughs> Make some, uh, that'd be kind of cool too, right? You know, I, actually, down the line, actually, perhaps, right? I actually have a, a Japanese uh, publisher who's translating my books into Japanese. So that's been pretty neat. But if, I mean, anyone else out there wants to translate my books into other languages, I'm certainly um, open to hearing from them and discussing what that might look like. All right, cool, cool. So, um, yeah, can you mention your um, the websites that you run and where people can find you online if they want to connect with you? Sure. Um, well, you can definitely find me on Facebook, and I actually run a um, a couple Facebook groups. Uh, one which is Magical Experiments, and the other which is Indie Author Business Success for those interested in self publishing. And then my websites uh, for the fiction is ImagineYourReality.com, mm -hmm. and for the um, for the self publishing, it's IndieAuthorBusinessSuccess.com, which is a mouthful, but don't worry, you can you can type it all out. And then uh, magicalexperiments.com for the occult. Okay. And your books, um, they're available on like Amazon or ebook form too. Is that, is that right? Correct. Or... They're available. They're available on mm -hmm. Amazon and ebook and print and in some cases, mm -hmm. audiobook as well. Oh, great. Okay. That sounds excellent. All right. So I guess uh, we can wrap it up here, but uh, thanks for coming on. And like I said, I'll include um, all the links in the show notes if anyone wants to check out your work and uh, until next time. All right. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it.